Carlsbad, California, and a private collection of American muscle cars. As an icon of the late 60s, muscle cars vie with kipper ties and flared trousers, and the formula for these cars was just as subtle. It didn't take an awful lot of uh, creative thought to suggest the idea of uh, what would happen if we called on kind of an old hot rodder's trick and stuffed a big engine, a six or a seven liter engine, into a smaller car. There was one snag. General Motors said light bodies shouldn't have big engines. Jim, however, was undeterred. We were working with a 389 cubic inch or a 6.5 liter engine, which produced a significant more torque, significant more horsepower, and obviously significant more performance. To name their first muscle car, Pontiac looked to Italy for inspiration. Gran Turismo Omologato. Pontiac kind of thought that was a nifty little moniker, kind of a neat uh, way to say that here was a car that enjoyed a lot of race car characteristics, a big engine and a smaller car, and yet it was put together with a car that was drivable, streetable, and, and said, why not? They finally agreed to build 5,000 of them, which at that time really was not a very significant number. They ended up in the 1964 model year selling over 31,000 of them and could very easily have sold 62,000 of them if they had been able to build them. The Pontiac GTO spawned other wildly overpowered monsters. They weren't too hot on the bends, the braking was more eventual than now, but there was still only one design rule, go completely over the top and then a lot further. And still lighter bodies ushered in the pony car. By putting the same lineup of engines that were offered on the muscle cars into that pony car concept, where the car was two and three and four hundred pounds lighter, we ran into still another restriction from the General Motors Corporation, the Parrot Corporation, by having a car with too much power. Even then, Jim and the Pontiac Rebels found a way round GM's caution. By putting the same engine in the car with lighter weight, we put a throttle stop on the accelerator linkage so that it prevented the car from getting a full throttle opening setting. It took them usually between 30 seconds and a minute to remove it. <laughs> it was simply a little clip that uh, you grabbed hold of and pulled right off, and that enabled the throttle linkage to go to its maximum length and that gave you full throttle. But by 1973, the end was in sight for gas-guzzling muscle. The, the nail in the coffin was really the first energy crisis that we had, which occurred late in 1973, which really made it almost unpatriotic to be driving cars that were so-called gas guzzlers. Jim now collects muscle, but his everyday Chevy doesn't break the habits of a lifetime. Well, as a matter of fact, you know, this has got a uh, double overhead cam and four valves, and uh, it's a pretty sophisticated thing, but there's always the great equalizer. The great equalizer in the form of nitrous oxide. 